Are you a burnt out overachiever buried in responsibilities? Do you miss laughing with your friends, just laughing from the gut? Do you feel like life's passing you by? If you've been wishing for some kind of shift, you're in the right place. Welcome to 52 Weeks of Hope, the show where we take you off the hamster wheel by ditching your to-do list for the to-don't list. This is where you get to learn how to make that lonely ache vanish. Learn self-compassion techniques and to give yourself grace. I'm Lauren Abrams, and I get to help you feel that magic again since going through my own dark night of the soul, so you can learn from my experience and the mentors and experts I meet along the way. And today we're talking to author, three times TEDx speaker, and your communications guru, giving you clarity and voice, Sam Horn. Do you ever get tongue-tied or wonder how to respond to a question? Would you love to know the best and most memorable way to tell someone what you do or about yourself? Wouldn't you just love to drop the elevator pitch? Imagine knowing the perfect response from work settings to parties to dog parks. You get to have that because we have the expert here today. Sam's gonna let you know what to say and what not to say at home, work, online, in public. She's here helping you to respond on your feet. Welcome to 52 Weeks of Hope, Sam. Thanks so much, Lauren. I'm looking forward to sharing some stories and insights with your community. Ah, thanks. And I've got your newer book, Talking on Eggshells. Your bio is so long, I can't, I'm not going to go through all of that. And you are the communications guru, which I absolutely love. I love the way communication moves us. And is this something that like, it's intuitive to you? I mean, we all end up doing what we're supposed to or meant to do, I believe. But how'd you end up in this area? You know, it's, isn't it ironic is that we're taught math and science and mm-hmm. history in school. We're not taught how, what to say when someone blames us for something that's not our fault. We're not taught what to say in the first 60 seconds of a presentation that gets people's mm-hmm. eyebrows up. So I figured that I was going to share real life examples uh, that we face at work, at home and online on what to say when we don't know what to say. And uh, as a result, I've had a chance to speak around the world for groups ranging from Intel to Oracle to Accenture. And it all is on exactly what's the situation you face and you're tongue tied or tongue twisted. Well, here's what to say so that you can create confidence in that situation. And I love your TEDx talk where actually you you have a couple of my favorite quotes, like enough about me. What do you think about me? And oh, the Carrie Fisher one with something isn't fast enough. What is Instant gratification yes, takes right. too long. So yeah. shall I put people in the scene of, remember yes. Carrie Fisher, cinnamon bun ears, yeah. Star Wars, right? Well, I helped start and run the Maui Writers Conference for 17 years. You could jump the chain of command, pitch your screenplay to Ron Howard. You could pitch your novel to the head of Simon and Schuster it was just unprecedented. And Carrie Fisher was one of our favorite keynoters. And I will always remember she took the stage and she gripped the lectern and she paused for the longest time. And then she leaned out to the group and she said, instant gratification takes too long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of the premise of what we talk about is the clock starts ticking the second we start talking. How can we hit the ground running so that what we say is so interesting, so relevant, so actionable that even the busiest, most skeptical people choose to give us their attention? Okay, so how can we? (laughs) Good. Okay. Let's. uh, So, everyone, think of a situation coming up. Maybe it's a meeting where you're going to be giving a report. Maybe you're speaking for your local PTA or Rotary Club or your industry organization. So let me tell you a quick story about what you can say in the first 60 seconds that's guaranteed to get people interested. I was a pitch coach for Springboard Enterprises, and we've helped entrepreneurs generate $26 billion in funding. So Kathleen Callender, who is a Springboard client, came to me. She said, Sam, I got good news and I got bad news. I said, what's the good news? She said, I'm speaking in front of a room full of investors at the Paley Center in New York. I said, that's fantastic news. I said, what's the bad news? She said, I'm going at 2.30 and I only have 10 minutes. She said, you can't say anything in 10 minutes. And I said, Kathleen, you don't have 10 minutes, you have 60 seconds. So here's the 60 second opening we came up with And I hope everyone listening is ready to take notes because we're going to unpack this. There's three steps to it so that wherever you go and you want people's attention, if you do this, they will give you their attention and their respect and maybe even their yes. Ready for that 60 seconds? Okay, go. Okay. Did you know there are 1.8 billion vaccinations given every year? 
did you know up to a third of them are given with reused needles? Did you know we're spreading and perpetuating the very diseases we're trying to prevent? Imagine if there were a painless one-use needle for a fraction of the current cost. You don't have to imagine it. We're doing it. And she's off and running. Are your eyebrows up, Lauren? Yeah. And, and you talk about um, what eyebrows up means. You bet, is that back to the Maui Writers Conference, is that there was a woman who walked out of her session with tears in her eyes. I went over, I said, are you okay? She said, I just saw my dream go down the drain. And I said, what happened? She said, I put my 300 page manuscript on the table. The agent took one look at it, said, I don't have time to read all that. And he, he said, tell me in 60 seconds what your book is about and why someone would want to read it. She said, my mind went blank. She said, I spent three years writing it. I thought it was his job to sell it. <laughs> and, and I talked with Bob Loomis, who was senior VP of Random House. And he said, Sam, we've seen thousands of proposals. We make up our mind in 60 seconds whether something is commercially viable. And Lauren, that next day I stood in the back and I watched pitches and I could predict who was getting interest in their project without hearing a word being said Based on one thing, guess what it was? I did research on you, and so I, and I was shocked when you said it's the eyebrows. I was like, "What?" <laughs> but this is we so good. No, so. just right now, everyone watching, think of what do you care about? What do you want other people to care about? Could be an idea, could be a product, could be a business, could be a service, could be some cause that you care about. You can predict in sixty seconds whether the person you're talking to cares. Just watch your eyebrows. Because if their eyebrows are crunched up, like right now, crunch, don't you feel confused? Yeah. Confused people don't say yes, and they don't keep listening. Now, if their eyebrows are unmoved, it means they're unmoved, or they've had Botox. <laughs> yeah. Now, right now, everyone, yeah. just, you're, ah, do you feel yeah. intrigued, curious? Yeah. And I'm listening better. I listen better when I do that. Oh, I am. I'm paying way more attention when my eyebrows go up. Yeah. Exactly. So exactly. good. Yeah. So how do you do a 60 second? So here's the three to... steps yeah. right now. And because we want this to be as actionable and as uh, not just intriguing, it's something that everyone watching can put into use about something they care about. So step one is that go to Google and put in what are startling statistics about blank about the industry that you're targeting, about the demographic that you're meeting, about the problem you're solving, about the, uh, the issue you're addressing, because up will come statistics even you didn't know. And one of the quickest way to get a skeptic's attention is to introduce something they don't know that they wanna know. So if you say, did you know this? Did you know this? Did you? And they're going, I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't know that many people were being affected. I didn't know it was getting worse. Do you see how we're asking instead of telling? We've already turned this into a dialogue instead of a monologue. In the first 10 seconds, we got the eyebrows up. Yeah, yeah. Now the, the second step is to use the word imagine. Because if people are preoccupied, they're not really paying attention. As soon as you say, imagine this, they're picturing your point. They're seeing what you're saying. Imagine this, if you could reduce that cost. Imagine if that many people didn't have to be affected. Imagine if you could do it faster. Imagine if you could do it cheaper. People are thinking, sounds pretty good. And now the third step, you don't have to imagine it. We're doing it. Now come in with your precedence or your evidence to show it's not speculative or pie in the sky. It's a done deal. And here's the testimonial. Here's the case study. Here's the article where it says it's true. You can do that in 60 seconds. Other people are still in phobicity, you know, telling people who they are or explaining their idea in phobicity. You hit the ground running. The eyebrows are up. They're already intrigued, engaged, and they want to keep listening. Is in phobicity your word? That's, yes. That's interesting. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> that, that was good. So those are your three steps. And is that a 60-second little blueprint? Would that work in the dog park? Uh, well, let's give an example. Maybe okay. you meet in the dog park, you know, Fido and Fifi are having a good time and someone says, what do you do? Now, if it's a casual conversation, we're not going to pitch our idea or we're no. not going to talk about you know, that. So here's another way we can introduce ourselves that really even works in the dog park. Ready? Yes. Okay. Let's not do the elevator speech. I help blank do blank. 
because people go, oh, it's the end of the conversation. We don't want to end the conversation. We want to open the conversation. So let me give you an example so you see how this works in the real world, and then we'll unpack it. So from now on, when someone says, what do you do, whether it's at the dog park or in line at the theater or at um, you know a conference or something, you've got a less than 60 second answer that actually leads to a meaningful conversation. So I'm speaking at Inc. 500. Now, Tim Ferriss, Jim Collins, Tom Peters, you know, are all there. And yet this was the most popular session because we worked on people's elevator speech, turning it into an elevator connection. So here's Colleen. She was Entrepreneur of the Year for the state of, of Oklahoma. And I said, so what do you do? Wah, wah. Wah, 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 wah. Lauren, at the end of 60 seconds, no one in the room had any idea what she did. And she was the CEO. <laughs> I mean, think about the lost opportunity cost, right? So I said, can we play? She said, sure. I said, what do you do that we can see or smell or taste or touch? And she said something about magnetic resonating imaging devices. <laughs> and my light bulb went off. I said, oh. Do you run the medical facilities that offer MRIs and CAT scans? She said, yes. I said, don't tell people that. Because if you ask and you tell people what they do, they go, oh, into conversation. I said, ask a three-part question. Do you know anyone, could be yourself, a friend, or family member who's had an MRI or CAT scan? Now, put a sock in it. Because they may say, well, I haven't. But my daughter, she hurt her knee playing soccer. She had an MRI. Now, we just link what we do. To what they just said. Oh, I run the medical facilities that offer MRIs like the one your daughter had when she heard her knee playing soccer. Oh, look, they get it. Both people are talking in the first 60 seconds. It's a dialogue instead of I help blank do blank. And believe me, it leads to a lot more mutually rewarding conversations instead of a dead end. So you're an author of many, many books that are just incredibly successful. And we've got talking on eggshells, which I'll get to in a minute. How would you introduce yourself? Ah, you, thank you. It's like, I, as you can tell, I don't believe in scripts, right? I believe in human interactions yes. where it depends on the person I'm talking to or the situation. So, you know, I just spoke at Joe Polish's Genius Network and Conscious Capitalism. So I ask myself, what would people there care about? What would they be interested in? What is relevant to them where they would want to talk about it? Well, I know that many people want to write a book. So I do a lot of different things, but I'm not going to throw it all in and introduction and have people backing up as fast as they can. So I might say, do you know anyone could be yourself, someone in your business, you know, or a colleague who is interested in writing a book? And then I put a sock in it. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say, well, that would be me, or that would be our VP of sales, or that would be my brother or something like that. Now, I would ask another question, you know, have they already started it? Do they have a working title or something? Because they're going to say, oh, they've been talking about it for years, but they haven't yeah, yeah. done anything, you know. <laughs> Sounds they, right. <laughs> say, oh, yeah, you know, he, every morning he gets up at five and writes for an hour. See, we ask another question. Because then I can say, I help people like your brother who's got an idea, you know, actually get it out of their head and into the world in under a year. Ah, how do you do that? What's an example of that? And once again, we're off on a genuinely, mutually interesting, rewarding conversation, all because I asked instead of explained. Yeah, no, and that is so good. And Sam does have all of that. It's on her website. It's all the links are there. Don't worry. And I love, I love that, the way you just did that. And this is why I said your bio is so long because <laughs> you, you've also authored, what, nine books? I don't even, I, like, yeah. Okay. And uh, there's a term in your newest book, Talking on Eggshells, that I love, proactive grace. But before I get to that, last year's word of the year is authentic. And this is what everything you're talking about is. And it's just so interesting that like, what was it before? Like we weren't being authentic. Like how do you connect if you're not being authentic? <laughs> and this, and your newest book, Talking on Eggshells, is, it's about kindness. There's so much about kindness and like, how can we not be kind? <laughs> and how are you not going to connect if it's that way? So, okay. So what prompted this, 
Coast book. I'm holding up the book for everybody who's not looking at the video, talking on eggshells, <laughs> which is fabulous. And it's easy to read. If you just go to the index itself, and you can look up just what you want. Are you being bullied? Are you being manipulated? Do you want to know what to do if you're being manipulated? Like everything is just very, very easy. Or just what kind of relationship are you looking to deal with? Just look at the index. There it is. It's it's just easy and it's fun. It's fun to read. It's real life situations and scenarios. So now you can answer my question. And Lauren, first, thank you, because my dad used to say, if someone gives you a compliment, it's always welcome. However, if it's from a colleague and they pinpoint one of your values, it's even more meaningful. And what you just said is that in a world of infobesity, I didn't want to write a book that was hard to read or that was so like, you know, oh my gosh, this is like hard work, et cetera. So as you say, the table of contents is what to do if someone, you know, is blaming you for something that's not your fault, what to do if someone is interrupting you, what to do if someone's like a nonstop talker. And then it's a real life situation. And then we unpack it so that if you're ever in that situation again, finally, we know what to say instead of what not to say. Want one of my favorite examples? Yes, definitely. Okay. Now, I think you know, I believe in juxtaposing. So as long as people aren't driving, if they get a fresh piece of paper and they put a vertical line down the center, on the left are words to lose and on the right are words to use. Because there really are words that trigger resentment and resistant, and we can replace them with words that actually set up rapport and respect. Why wouldn't we do that, right? <laughs> yeah. So here's an example of how we can do that. And, and there's actually many words to lose and their replacement. Here's one. So I'm visiting my son, Andrew, in Brooklyn. And his one-year-old son, Hero, is crawling across the floor. He hauls himself up on a guitar over in the corner. He starts banging on the strings. Now, over on the left, Andrew could have said, stop banging on the strings. He could have said, you should have been more careful. He should have, he could have yanked the guitar away, all of which would have made Hero feel worse. Lauren, instead, he said one word. You know what the word was? Mm. Gentle. And I saw Hero's face transform in front of me. And he reached back to the guitar. He went strum, strum, mm. strum. And in that moment, Hero made music, and it was because instead of shaming his behavior, Andrew shaped his behavior. Instead of criticizing him for doing it wrong, he coached him on how to do it right. Instead of losing face over that situation, Hero learned from that situation because instead of making him feel bad, Andrew showed him how to do it better. So I hope everyone listening and watching, let's get rid of that word should and stop. Because if we say stop interrupting me, stop teasing your sister, stop being late, or you should have called if you're, you know, when we use the word should and stop, we actually reinforce the negative behavior. Instead, what do we want them to start? Instead, what do we want them to do next time from now on in the future? Now we're being a coach instead of a critic, and we're shaping their behavior instead of shaming it. I love that. And this book is full of these kinds of examples. They're all through it. And in the back, there's just a whole list of them, of a column of what to say and what not to say. Like the better choice, <laughs> I'll say. Lauren, I'm so glad you brought that up. And, and there is a reason why I did that. And if we want to make complex ideas crystal clear, I'm going to give you the answers to the test. Whether you're in a meeting and you're taking notes, whether you are writing a book, whether you're giving a presentation, whether you just want people to hear what you're saying and be able to act on it. Once again, get a fresh piece of paper, put a vertical line down the center. On the left, what are the beliefs and the behaviors that are sabotaging success? Over on the right, put the beliefs and the behaviors that support success. So do you see how, if we're talking about when people complain over on the left, put don't explain because explanations come across as excuses. Yes. They actually make things worse because people feel we're not being accountable. So now let's show the shift. Let's show what to say instead of not to say. Over on the right, write down the A train. A for agree, A for apologize, A for act. 
instead of uh, say that we're late picking someone up and they said, you were supposed to be here an hour ago over on the left, explain, I know I got caught in traffic, mm -hmm. you know, and they say, well, why didn't you call? Oh, my phone died. I couldn't see down, down, and I'm down, listening, down. And I'm listening for the apology. Like, wait, when are you going to apologize as you're saying this? <laughs> Lauren, see, over on the right, look what happens if we say A for agree. You're right. I, I like was supposed to be agree. here an hour ago. I apologize. I like that A. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't heard that before. So yeah. wait, well, I don't want to lose this thought because I know so many people and, and you've got help people write books and everything else and get it done. I know so many people that have been working on their book. So what if they're procrastinating? What's on the other side of that? I'm so glad you brought that up. And once again, I believe you give the real life example first to show how this is in the real world. And then you unpack it, you reverse engineer it so people can apply it to their own circumstances. So very first year of the Maui Writers Conference, I was the MC as well as the executive director. So I would go in the morning and walk the beach to get my introduction straight for the day. Here's this woman crying on the beach. And I went over, I said, are you okay? She said, I don't belong here. I said, you don't belong here? She said, who am I to write a book? She said, it's like you're putting yourself up on a pedestal. You know, I know you don't. I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. You know, it feels kind of arrogant. I don't think that I've got what it takes to write a book. And I said, Jana, I said, what do you want to write about? Well, she and her husband had adopted a child and he was very challenging. She said, I went to the bookstore. I went to the library to try and find books. There are all these books on what a blessing it is to be an adoptive parent. They made me feel worse. She said, I want to write the book I need. I can't find. And I said, like, what's an example of what you want to put in your book? And she thought about it for a moment. She said, I want to talk about the time that Ari was three years old and I fixed spaghetti for dinner. And he reaches across the table and he grabs a handful of spaghetti and he throws it in my face. And my first thought was, my son would never have done that. And the shame that I felt that that thought had even occurred to me. I said, what else? She says, even though it's challenging when it's time to send pictures of Ari to his birth mother, I edit out the cute ones because I live in daily fear she's going to change her mind and want him back. And I said, Jana, the question to ask is not, am I perfect? Do I have a PhD? I said, you know what the question to ask is? Would someone reading my book benefit? Because if someone reading your book will benefit, not only do you have the right to write, you have a responsibility. Yeah, there's a duty. Yeah. By the way, people can go online and look up Jana Wolf, Secret Thoughts of an adoptive mother. And I had a chance to run into Jana a couple of years ago and I was speaking in Hawaii. And she said, not a week goes by that she doesn't get an email from someone saying, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> so if you can write a book, the question is not if you're the world's expert or if you have an MBA. No, the question is, would someone reading your book benefit? And if so, write on. Yay, you're being of service. Mm -hmm. And I always like to say, nobody can do it the way you can do it. We all have our own unique handprint for a reason. So, oh, I love that. Uh, what's the hardest challenge you've ever gone through and how did you get through it? Hmm. What a wonderful question. I think uh, the hardest challenge I ever went through was probably my divorce. It was a toxic divorce. And at that point, what I wanted more than anything in the world was for my sons to grow up and to be healthy individuals who had loving relationships with women, had the light on in their eyes, and they were doing work that mattered and that they were good citizens. How I got through it is Mary Morrissey says, hold the vision, not the circumstances. <laughs> <sighs> And so that was my vision, is that we would get on the other side of this, that I would continue to act in integrity, that I would model for my sons how to be respectful to others and to hold on to that vision and belief that they would grow up to be, as I said, happy, healthy, contributing adults in loving relationships. And that's happened. It's one of my, the great gifts of my life. 
Oh, I love, love, love that. And one of your other, your earlier TED Talks, it's your son, I think, that saying something to you that prompted you to become an author, which I absolutely love. When he's like, why are you working yourself to death? Which I particularly love, and you may have heard it in the introduction on a whole thing about taking the pause, take a breath, get off the hamster wheel, play with your kids. <laughs> Answers emerge in the pause. It's why, I mean, you talk about taking a walk on the beach before giving your speech. And I just think it's so important. So how do you take your pause? Are there certain things that you do so that you're not constantly on the hamster wheel? Because it seems to me that you do do a lot. <laughs> So here's the origin story of what Andrew had said that actually changed the course of my life is that I had just finished a very intensive consult in Southern California and I was returning the rental car and, and Andrew called and he sensed something in my voice and he said, what's up, mom? I said, Andrew, I'm so exhausted. I don't know how I'm going to get on that plane tonight. I've got to fly back to DC and fly back to do a keynote in San Francisco in a couple of days. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And thank heaven, he said, Mom, there's something about you I don't understand. You have your own business. You can do anything you want, and you're not taking advantage of it. And I realized out of the mouths of 20-somethings, and that along with a quote from Paulo Coelho, and he said, one day you're going to wake up, and there won't be any time left to do the things you've always wanted to do. So I gave away 95% of what I owned and I took my business on a year by the water. And I sailed the Chesapeake Bay and, and went to Giverny, Monet's Garden, and I interviewed people. And I said, are you happy? And if so, why? And if not, why not? And the river that ran through my interviews is that how many people were so busy. And when I said, what do you want to do? And they said, well, I'm going to do that when I retire. Well, I'm going to do that when the kids go off to school, when I'm going to do that, when I you know, finish this project. And there was a 30 something and he was married. He had a full-time job. He had two kids with special needs. And when I said, what's your dream? And he looked at me and he said, I don't dream anymore. It's too painful. <laughs> and I wrote a book called Someday is Not a Day in the Week. And Lauren, right in uh, alignment with your work is the clock is ticking and that's not morbid, that's motivating. Who and what really matter and what can we do to spend more time with them now instead of waiting for later because now is the new later. Oh, I love that. That the origin of 52 Weeks of Hope is me interviewing a much older demographic saying, why are we here? What have you gleaned from living life? They say nobody on their deathbed work, wish they worked harder, made more money. So what have you gleaned? And the answers are in connection with others. And it's not on a screen. It's physically being with other people. And uh, we need community. We need to be together. And I just love that, the commonality there. So do you have a message I hope you want to give? Sure. It is Catherine Graham of the Washington Post said to do what you love and feel that it matters. How could anything be more fun? And once again, if one of the great joys of my love is helping people get crystal clear about their contribution, because Pablo Picasso said, the purpose of life is to find your gifts. The meaning is to give them away. So I help people figure out their legacy message. What have they learned over the years? You know, what do they want to pass along? How could they put that in a book? How could they put that in a TEDx talk? How could they put that in something that is their message in a bottle so that they are clear about their gifts, they're giving them away, and they're leading a life of ikigai, and that's a Japanese word for a reason to wake up in the morning, something to look forward to, so that on a daily basis, we're making time for who and what matters, and we're living our life purposefully in a way that we know that we're making a difference. That's great. Is there something that people listening, because everyone listening cannot work with you, or maybe they could, I have no idea I've, really how that works. I know you have some videos and everything, but the one-on-one, -on -one, are there certain steps that people could take to start on that path? You bet. I do have a couple of online programs. One is So You Want to Write a Book that actually talks you through that step-by-step -step process. And, and it's kind of like, you know, this inspiring 
oh my goodness, I wouldn't have known about that. Oh my goodness, I would have spent all that time going down that wrong path. You know, so that is one option. Another is, is that, you know, my books are available on Audible and, you know, you can often get an Audible book for a buck. <laughs> and so like uh, places to start are probably the some days, not a day in the week book, because that helps you get clear why you're here. And then how are you going to make that happen now and not someday? And maybe the second book would be hmm, probably the Got Your Attention book, because it is now, whether you're working in an organization, whether you have your own business, whether you're a single mom, whatever, it is figuring out how you can communicate what you care about so other people care about it too, whether that's your kids, whether that's your boss, whether that's an investor. And there is a way to speak clearly and concisely and compellingly in a way that people want to hear what you have to say. They get and value what they're saying, and they're more likely to remember it and act on it. Yeah, and that is great. Okay, so I don't want to forget the proactive grace. Mm. I, I just want, can you just talk about that briefly? You bet. Is that Pema Schroden said, do not let people pull you into their storm pull them into your peace. <laughs> and Mother Teresa said, the world is full of good people. If you can't find one, be one. <laughs> and Elvis Presley said, when things go wrong, don't go with them. <laughs> <laughs> and see, we may agree with all that. We just don't know how to do it. And proactive grace, I think kindness and compassion are very important. And I don't think they're enough. I think that proactive grace is in a situation, it's helping people find solutions, not fault. It's turning a conflict into a clarifying conversation. It's using warm words like thank you, appreciate, look forward, instead of just business is not personal and just, you know, just the facts, etc. It is being a force for good on a daily basis with the way we listen with the way we put ourselves in another person's shoes and we empathize with them. And then we choose to respond instead of react so that we're setting an example of integrity where people choose to respond in kind. Uh, I love that. I'm so happy that you joined us today. And uh, is there any question that I didn't ask you that we're going to be done? You're going to be like, oh, Lauren didn't ask me this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, here is something that we haven't talked about yet that I think is integral to all of this is that do you have a mission statement? Because I was very fortunate in college, our philosophy professor, the very first day of class, he said, we're going to study Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. He said, but first you're going to come up with your own philosophy. And it needed to be under 100 words and we had a week to work on it. And so I came up with my philosophy decades ago, and I haven't changed a word since. And it's, be, it's my North Star. It guides my actions. And my philosophy is, my purpose is, my mission is to make a positive difference for as many people as possible while maintaining a happy, healthy life with friends and family. So to come up with your mission statement is professional and personal. So what is your goal in terms of your career or your legacy or how you're going to add value in your community, et cetera, while doing what? While, you know, loving life, while being out in nature, while spending time with the people you care about? Because if you have clarity about that, if you post it where it's in sight, in mind, on a daily basis, when we start getting busy, when we start getting uh, pulled off course, we have a way to come back to center and to be crystal clear how we can continue to be the person we want to be, even when other people aren't. Oh, that's good. I'm so glad you added that. That's amazing. Thank you so much for being a guest today on 52 Weeks of Hope. You're welcome. I hope that people have found it inspiring and useful and they get clear on, on their ikigai and their mission statement, and then they lead into it on a daily basis. Yeah, same. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and take with you Sam's messages of clarity, authenticity, and connection. Such great messages to take into your week ahead. Be sure to tune in next week for another empowering episode. It's all about how to live authentically, abundantly, and how to simply feel better in a moment when something happens. 
It's also about embracing the lessons and growth from your life's journey. It's such a good episode. You're going to love this one. That's next week. You don't want to miss it. Be sure to share the episode with your friends and to rate and review the podcast so more people feel less alone in the overwhelm. And remember the pause. Answers emerge in the pause. And instead of adding to your to-do list, how about a to-don't list? This is a show for burnt out overachieving type A'ers. Unlike other shows for burnt out overachievers, only we take you off the hamster wheel by ditching your to-do list for that to-don't list. Until next week, I'm Lauren Abrams. Thanks for listening. 